juggling in the, ten, in the past 10 years, or actually all my adult life, between two main passions. One is the passion of cognition, or neuroscience. What could be more interesting than how the brain works? How we actually understand other people, communicate with them, think, learn, feel, remember. The second passion was to try to understand and help other people in their desires, feels, and struggles. And so, after learning cognitive science, I continued to study clinical psychology to see if I could really understand how other people are feeling or thinking, how they experience the world, to see if I can be in their shoes, but at the same time, take a different perspective and help them to see things differently. So I guess it was only natural that my PhD combined the two, focusing on brain mechanisms which enable our understanding of other people's minds. My research, together with Professor Shlomo Bentin, focused on brain oscillations, brain rhythms known as mu waves, which are thought to be part of a larger brain network which enables our understanding of other people. But before that, I want to start with an example from a wonderful book by Mark Haddon called The Curious Incident of the Dog at Nighttime. And it starts like this. My name is Christopher John Francis Boone. I know all the countries of the world and their capital cities and every prime number up to 7,057. Eight years ago, when I first met Sioban, she showed me this picture. And I knew that it meant sad, which is what I felt when I found the dead dog. Then she showed me this picture. And I knew that it meant happy, like when I'm reading about the Apollo space missions, or when I'm still awake at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning, and I can walk up and down the street and pretend that I'm the only person in the whole world. Then she drew some other pictures. But I was not able to say what these meant. I got Sioban to draw lots of these faces and then write down next to them what exactly they meant. I kept the piece of paper in my pocket and took it out when I didn't understand what someone was saying. But it was very difficult to decide which of the diagrams was most like the face they were making because people's faces move very quickly. When I told Sioban that I was doing this, she got out a pencil and another piece of paper and said it probably made people feel very... Now, we're different from the narrator Christopher. We understood these emotions easily. We actually are experts at it and we do it without thinking all throughout the day. But in fact, it's very difficult and sometimes even impossible for people with disorders of social cognition to understand other people's thoughts and feelings. People with Asperger's syndrome, autism, or schizophrenia sometimes even don't understand that others may have thoughts and feelings which are different from their own. Now, psychologists and philosophers have been bothered with this question of how we actually understand other people's minds long before neuroscience with any formal field of study. And they came up with a lot of different theories. I'll present two of these theories today, which are still under debate. One theory, also known as simulation theory, basically says that when we want to understand what someone else is thinking or feeling, our mind simulates the same motor acts as if we were doing them ourselves, and from that understands what that person must be feeling. So, for example, if I see someone sitting quietly with their head hung low, my mind simulates the same motor actions as if I were doing them myself, and from that understands that when I sit like this, I'm usually sad, so this person is probably sad. The second theory, sometimes known as theory theory, basically says that when young children, as they grow up, try to understand the world around them, they use the same cognitive mechanisms that adults use in science. That is, they develop theories. These theories help them understand the world around them. So when a small child sees someone sitting quietly with her head hung low, she might first think the person's happy. But after a few times she's proven wrong, she'll understand that this posture probably means that the person is sad. So what really happens in the brain? 
Well, some of you may have already heard about mirror neurons. These special neurons, which, like a lot of good science, were discovered quite by mistake, were discovered in the early 90s by a group of researchers in Italy, led by Professor Rizzolatti. These researchers were studying motor neurons in the monkey, neurons that fire when the monkey does a particular action. For example, when the monkey grasps to take a banana. One day, the researcher himself grasped to take a banana, and the same neurons in the monkey started firing. Now imagine the same neuron firing when a monkey does a particular action and when he sees someone else doing the same action. This was actually the first biological evidence for simulation theory. The same neurons firing both when you do an action and when you see someone else. Now this is extraordinary, but when you think about it, it's also quite intuitive. We all know about the yawning effect, how when we see someone else yawning, we automatically start yawning ourselves, and sometimes even start getting tired. But let's look at some more examples. You can really feel these neurons working, can't you? <laughs> and indeed, in the past two decades, researchers have been studying these mirror-like regions in the human brain, thinking that these must be the basis for our higher social cognition skills, such as understanding other people's intentions, emotions, language, and even enabling empathy. One example of such brain regions is called the pain matrix. This matrix of regions is active when we experience pain, but also when we see someone else experiencing pain, just like we did today. I want to tell you some interesting facts about these regions. First, they're more active when we see someone we're familiar with experiencing pain, such as a family member or a friend. Also, I want to tell you about a really nice experiment done about these regions a few years ago in Switzerland, led by Professor Singer and her group. And what they did is they had participants play a competitive game against fair and unfair players, and later see these players experiencing pain. So when they saw fair players experiencing pain, these same empathy-related regions lit up in the brain. But what happened when participants saw unfair players experiencing pain? Here there was a big difference between male and female participants. Well, in female participants, the exact same brain region, this empathy network, was active when they saw unfair players experiencing pain. These regions were almost not active at all in the male brain. In fact, other regions were active, regions which are known to be correlated with the feeling of reward or revenge. <laughs> now, as much as this is an interesting result, I think it's not that surprising for most of us. So. Is the mirror neurons the whole story? Can simulation really be the whole story? Can we only understand people who look like us, behave like us, react like us? Can we not understand anyone who behaves or reacts a bit differently? Let me give you an example from my daily life. My husband's meals are sacred to him. If he's hungry, he can't concentrate, he gets irritated, and so he plans ahead and has to know what we're having for dinner at 8 a.m. in the morning. Now at first, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't empathize with it however I tried. But then one day I realized that what he's feeling is actually exactly what I feel when I'm tired. I can't concentrate. I don't enjoy anything I do, and so I try to plan ahead and get enough hours of sleep. Now that wasn't simple simulation, was it? It required some cognitive reasoning, some thought. But today, when he wants to know what we're having for dinner before we even had breakfast, I completely understand it. Now, it's a silly example, but I think we can easily extend it to much more serious examples from our daily life. For example, understanding other people's needs for religious rituals, which might mean nothing to me. Understanding the needs of minority groups. Understanding people with disabilities. You get the idea. True, it might be harder to understand those who are different from us. 
And if you live here like us in the Middle East, you might sometimes get the impression that people don't always understand one another. But we all know that if we give it a try, we can actually understand others even when they're different. And indeed, researchers found other brain regions, sometimes known as a mentalizing network. Regions which are active when we try to understand other people even when they're different. In fact, this may be where a kind of theory theory kind of reasoning take place. I was lucky enough to participate in one such experiment, which was led by Klaus Lam and Professor Jean de Cetit in their lab in Chicago. And what these researchers asked is the following question. They gave participants some pictures. We're going to do the same thing right now. And they asked them to try to feel what these people were feeling. So let's do it together. I'm going to show you two pictures and do your best to try to feel what these people are feeling. Now comes the hard part. They, they then told participants there was also another group of people. These people were a bit different from them. And in what way were they different? They were different in that they don't feel any pain when they're pricked by a needle. But they do feel pain when they're touched by a small brush or a Q-tip. Now let's see if we can try to feel what these people are feeling. Right now. And right now. Now this may have been harder for some of you, but I think if we give it a try, we can actually do it. And indeed the participants said the same thing. So let's see what happened in the brain. So when people saw similar others, which are similar to them, and they saw them experiencing pain, these empathy-related regions were active. And this is simple simulation, right? This is obvious. The same regions were also active when we saw some, someone that's dissimilar to us being pricked by a needle. Now, this is not painful for that person, but we saw that it happens to us almost automatically. We feel the pain in our body. But I think what was most interesting is that the same brain regions were active in these conditions, where we saw dissimilar others experiencing pain in a situation which is not painful for us at all. So, to conclude this one, there was the least activation when no one was feeling pain. The picture was not painful for me, and I know it's not painful for the other. But in all other conditions, when the condition was painful for me, even to watch, or painful for the other, these empathy-related regions were active. Now I want you to, to note an important thing about this experiment. We actually asked the participants, like we did here, to try to feel what these people were feeling. And this is not trivial. I think if we just showed them pictures of these different others being touched by a Q-tip, we might have not gotten the same results. But this is an important lesson. In fact, if we give it a try, if we give it some effort, if you give people some incentive, maybe if you give them some prior explanations, tell them the story of the other, we do have the ability and the brain mechanisms to help us, to help us understand other people even when they're different. And I think like a lot of cognitive mechanisms that we know from our daily lives, if we do it again and again, if we practice, we get better at it. Now before I end, I want to tell you a story that happened to me a few weeks ago. I gave a similar talk in a conference about philanthropy. And at the end of my talk, someone came up to me and said, she found it really sad and even disturbing that it all comes down to the brain. It all comes down to neurons. But what I think some of these studies tell us here is just how flexible this phenomenon of empathy is, just how flexible our brain is, how much it's affected by the social environment around us. So it's not just the brain that affects how we perceive the world around us, how we think, feel, and understand. It's the whole stimulation we get in the world the people we meet, learn from, talk to, try to really understand. All these truly change our brain, change our neural circuits, and by extension, change the way we see, perceive, and learn about the world. So, 
Go out there. Meet new people. Hear their stories. Try to understand those that are different from you. Challenge your brains and change the way you perceive the world around you.